So as you can see, I've, I've done this quite a bit. I started as a coach. I started as a player, then I became a coach. Uh, I was a teacher. I have a master's, like she said, in, in early childhood. So everything I do is couched in that perspective, which is very different from most coaches because most coaches come out as former players and we just do it the way it's always been done or the way it was done with us. And we never think about the science behind it. And I got really geeky about the science and started thinking about what drives play in children, what drives sports success, what drives that individual excellence in the brain and in the body for our kids. And so I started approaching everything that way. And so I'm big on the brain science. I'm big on the science behind it. But Drew already kicked us off with a bunch of the science, so I'm going to peel back from the science and actually talk about the applicable part of it. How do we apply play to sport? Why is it so important for our children and, and, and what's happening that it's missing? And then we'll talk a little bit, and I can't, I can't walk away from anything without giving takeaways, so I'll actually give you all takeaways that you can help your coaches, your teachers, your parents, everybody in your community start to figure out how we inject play back into sport. And then tonight I'm going to talk with the community itself, and we're going to talk about fulfilling those three basic needs of human beings through play. We do that. Our kids not only succeed in sport or whatever it is they're doing, activity, but they succeed in life. So the first thing is, why is play so important? Well, for me, as a coach, an epidemic that we've been facing for almost a decade now, and the numbers aren't changing, is that 7 out of 10 kids quit sports by age 13. These numbers aren't changing. In the U.S., we only had two sports in the U.S. last year that didn't see massive attrition rates, where the number of kids leaving the sport outpaced the number of kids entering the sport. It was lacrosse, and I'm blanking on the second one. No kidding. Um, it was lacrosse and rugby. Sorry. Those are the only two. And then I've talked to the Gaelic Games Association, uh, U.S. Gaelic Games Association. They're actually seeing a little bit of bump. Everybody else is adding athletes, but as many are peeling out because they're leaving by this age. What's important for me is the human brain doesn't stop developing until its mid-20s, which means the human body and everything else is still developing in rapid pace with it. The brain is rapidly developing in us into, until our mid-20s, and yet we're losing kids at 13. We're losing almost a decade or more of opportunity to pour into them the values, the life skills, the modeling of proper character behaviors, all the other pieces of the puzzle that allow them to succeed in life. And more importantly, we're, we're missing out on an opportunity. If you saw that rectangle, we're missing out on the opportunity to create people who are active for life. And that scares the living daylights out of me that our kids are leaving sport. Because sport coaches think about one thing, outcomes, wins, rankings, where we are in the table, how many goals we're scoring, all those other pieces of the puzzle. But what's more important is what we're doing in sports to create people that succeed in life, physically and mentally. And so here's the big issue when they leave sports by age 13. One of the things that we do with sports with our children is we allow them to learn to explore their own, like we talked about confidence and confidence, belonging, capability in their own world. And when we drive them out of sports, what happens is, is there's usually this breakdown in the mind of connecting sports to those negative experiences. And so what do we choose? We choose not to sport anymore in life. We burn out. How many of y'all were former athletes? How many of y'all are still active? Okay. How many of y'all had a bad experience in sport? How did that affect your wanting to be active? It alters it, right? Yes. Like you start to associate, especially when coaches use physical activity as a punishment. Oh, you were bad tonight. You, were, you didn't do what I told you to do. You played poorly. You lost this game for me. So get on the line. We're going to do sprints. Now what happens is kids associate physical activity with punishment. And as we grow into adulthood, we don't want to do those physical activities because we feel like it's a punishment. So that's one of the big issues that we have. So the video, what it shows is it asks a bunch of children, what? What would you do if you had five extra years? And kids are answering, I'd, I'd rule all the chipmunks. I'd build a helicopter out of wood. I'd build a time machine. I'd, they, I'd sing to the, a stadium full of people. All these kids, they asked them, what, you know, why does the five years matter? And at the end, one kid says, why are you asking me this? Well, the reason why it matters to us is that this generation, this current generation of children, will be the first generation ever to not outlive its parents. I'm not as powerful as the video, but let that sink in. I drive in the car. I have a 19-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 14-year-old. I saw this video three years ago. So at the time, I had a 9-year-old and an 11-year-old, which were the ones that were at that age that really mattered. The 16-year-old already sort of grooved into her active lifestyle and was starting to sport for life. But those two, 
it scared me because I'd look in the rear view mirror and I realized that my nine year old inherited living five years younger, five years shorter than me. That's the gift I gave my kids. My kids will live five less years than I will because they're not active. And here's the thing about being active. I've got a bad back. And my wife and I were talking about it the other day. It's been a year. I've done everything. I've been to every doctor I can. I, I try all the exercises. I've done yoga and acupuncture and Pilates. You name it, I've done it. And I still have muscular issues in my lower back. And my wife said the other day, she goes, I think I figured it out, honey. She goes, you went 90 miles an hour most of your life. And then one day you stopped coaching and you stopped moving. And she says, that's like, that's like being on the highway at 90 miles an hour and throwing the car in the park. Your body did not know how to handle the fact you just stopped. But that's what our kids do when they hit age 13. They just stop. And because of that, they're going to be five, they're going to pass away five years younger than our generation. That's the gift. We can reverse that. Here's why I use the term play when I work with coaches is because if you start talking physical literacy, if you start talking design to move, functional movement, patterns, Coaches gloss over, but if you start talking about play, unstructured versus structured play, and how we incorporate that more, coaches lean in and they want to hear a little bit more. So I just couch it all in the concept of play. But here's why play is so massively important for our kids. Because we think about one thing when we think about play, don't we? This, right? But Drew touched on it. There's an affective piece to play. There is a mental, there's a cognitive piece to play that really matters to us. And I'm going to toss up a slide that I know I think Mark has or Drew has later as well. And that's what play does for the brain. There is research out there. This is done by Charles Hillman at University of Illinois. We did, uh, for the Way of Champions podcast, we actually did a podcast with a, a, a physical education teacher who talks about it. There's a book out there called Spark that talks about what play does for the brain. This is what play does for the brain. These children took a math test, OK? After 20 minutes of sitting quietly and after 20 minutes of walking. This is the most active, and that's the least active part of the brain. Look at the brain after it moves. I was a kindergarten teacher. I got there, I was so excited, because here I was a coach. I'd been coaching for 20 years at that point. I was going to become a kindergarten teacher. This is going to be awesome. My kids are going to play and move and learn as they move. My principal says, there's no recess for the kindergartners. What? I did recess all the way up to like sixth grade. And then, and then they made sure I had PE in 6th, 7th, and 8th. I was still moving. I had swim classes in high school, walking across the freezing cold Ohio, Ohio tundra to the natatorium to swim, right? But no, kindergartners can't move. They can't play. So then I inherited this class of kids who were not good, according to the system. A bunch of kids that needed medication and a bunch of kids that were on IEPs and everything. And most of it had to do with movement issues. They were all called ADD and ADHD. No, they wanted to move. We'd coop them up like lions in a cage. What would you do? They're five. I watch my son. He is 12 years old now. And the boy, when he, study, he, he does an independent study with me, so three days a week of a, of a, a five-day week, he's at home doing like college-like courses, independent study. And then two days a week, he goes for an hour and a half class on each of his topics. It's a really cool school program in California. We put him in it because it's the only thing that fit him because this kid stands in the back of the classroom like this. When he studies at the kitchen table, he's got a desk in his room, kitchen table, couch, my office, backyard, you name it. When he studies, it's this. What are you doing? I'm working on my science right now, dad. Okay, here's the deal, man. And this kid is brilliant. He knows all the classifications of animals. He came up with something the other day. He corrected somebody at the zoo one time. We were talking about black panthers. That's his favorite cat. And he says, well, actually, what they are is they're melanistic. <laughs> she goes, excuse me? And he goes, well, yeah, they're melanistic. They have way too much pigment, so that's why they're that color. So, and they're actually, they're, they're an anomaly. He starts describing this to this zoo volunteer. He's like, kid, I was just going to show you where the cage was. <laughs> so, but we tell those kids that they must not be fit for school, that they must sit still, and there must be something wrong with them because they have to move. So I got my kindergarten class. Here I am, I'm dealing with 25 kids in the morning, and at least 15 to 17 of them, they can't sit still. They just can't sit still. So I said, if I can't take them out for recess, we're doing recess in our classroom. We created stations, and they would do things to learn. Skip count by skip count and hopping. Or uh, learning questions by hopping to different chunks and chunks 
for reading on the ground. And we wrote them on the ground and they'd have to hop to a hunk and chunk, hop to the k sound, hop to whatever it was. So they would, they would spend time at each station, they would work on those skills, and then they'd move. For me, <laughs> I was wearing them out a little bit and getting them to move. For them, they were learning while they moved. I didn't know about that brain research stuff yet. Right? I didn't know about this yet. But I noticed that their learning picked up after we did that stuff. And one day, principal comes in. What are you doing? They need to be sitting still listening to you. Thankfully, I had helpers in the room. One had been at the school for a couple decades, and she said, wait, watch how they learn. Well, then the research comes out. Children are actually better prepared to learn, and their brains are re more active and ready to learn after physical activity. If you want to give them their toughest, toughest subject, physics, let them have recess for 20 minutes. Then bring them in and teach them physics. Believe it or not, the brain is more prepared to learn after it's had movement, as you can see by the scan. This is why play matters to us. Because it's not just the physical aspects of our children, but if we want our children to actually build their brains, they need to move. And here's what's really cool if you want to connect it to sport for your sport coaches. Skill, when broken down to its basic principle, is just neurological. It's the myelin sheath around the neurons, the synapses of the neurons, thickening. In the brain, there are billions and billions and billions of neurons in children. Billions. As the brain uses neurons, it paves a nice, wide, paved path, well lit. That's one it's going to use regularly. But if the brain doesn't use a certain synaptic neural connection, it trims them back, lets the forest grow over, and it erases it. That's why children who learn languages by dual languages or tri-languages at a young age keep it, because they've paved that pathway. But if you don't use it in the beginning, it's harder. Skill is simply that myelin sheath like insulation around the neuron, thickening, to put it very simply. So if this is the skill of a movement pattern, as we wrap the myelin sheath around that movement pattern, it's getting thicker, like wrapping insulation around something or electrical tape around a wire. No myelin sheath means it frays, and it's really a difficult connection. It doesn't fire as efficiently and effectively. At its simplest form, neurologically, that's skill. So it would, stand to think, it, would, it would stand to reason that if that is skill, then why aren't coaches making sure the kids are playing and not standing in lines? Because if the brain is active and working and blood is flowing and there's all this red activity as they're moving, then that means those myelin sheaths have an opportunity to thicken even faster as they acquire skills because the brain is prepared to learn the skill. And yet, we put them in lines. We lecture them for 35 minutes on one skill, and then we release them one at a time to dribble through 900 cones and shoot on an empty goal. And we go, hey, I taught them a skill. That's how I did it. That's how my coaches did it. Here's the other things that play does for us. We already talked about the physical. It develops physical maturity. It develops physical competence. It gives us the ability to reduce injuries. It creates healthy lifestyle. It even affects sleep and nutrition. Children who are active have different sleep and nutritional patterns than children who are not. Because the body craves certain things based on our activity levels, right? So we eat based on our activity levels. So if we're working hard, our body's craving certain nutrients to replenish them. All right? For my son, it's, I call it game eating. Because he'll grab a bag of chips and settle down in front of his Fortnite game, and that bag of chips is gone in 30 seconds. He didn't even know he did it. Right? And I grew up with my parents watching my dad. We'd grab potato chips with ketchup, weirdest thing ever. We'd put a little ketchup on our potato chip, we'd, and we'd watch, but we didn't even know we'd gone through a bag. So it hasn't changed. Screen, right? Hab habitual eating. The second thing that play does for our children is the emotional development. It allows them to understand and regulate their own feelings and the feelings around, the, uh, around themselves, right, of other people. It allows them to deal with failure and overcome it. It allows them to try new things and overcome fear. It develops resilience, grit, durability, all those other pieces of the puzzle emotionally. As they play and try and learn, they develop. And you'll see that in a video later. Johan Cruyff, we've heard of him, right? One of the greatest moves of all time, and every coach tries to teach their players the Cruyff. We're going to do the Cruyff. We're going to stand in the line of 20 and one at a time do the Cruyff on a bunch of cones, right? Somebody once asked Johan Cruyff, 
he did the move. The first time he did the move was in an international game, going down the wing, defender, one of the top defenders in the world. He does the Cruyff. This guy about breaks his ankles and falls. Embarrasses him on an international scale. Absolutely brilliant move. And somebody said, how long had you practiced that move? How long had you worked on that until it became your move? And he says, uh, that moment, I made it up on the spot. Because he liked to play, he liked to experiment, he liked to test. Imagine the courage of somebody on that big a scale trying to move they've never tried before against one of the best defenders in the world. That's emotional development because he played a lot. Social. When children play, yes, as you all know, early childhood development, at first they parallel play, don't they? They don't play with other kids, but they play alongside. But that's part of the social connection piece. They're playing alongside because they realize what's happening around them. They're just not ready to incorporate those other pieces of the puzzle into their play. But they're beginning to socially accept the fact that others play near them. And then one day they incorporate, and it's no longer parallel play, it's group play, right? There's social interaction that happens when kids play. They learn to communicate differently, which we'll talk about in a second. They learn to uh, work together, to collaborate, to share to learn, to, to learn off each other, peer-assisted learning. Kids will play, free play at an unstructured playing opportunity, and they watch others and they go, oh, I like that move. I'm going to try that next. Cognitive. We just talked about that. The other pieces of the puzzle is just that the brain figures things out as we play. Space and time, uh, how to regulate um, bodily functions while we're playing, bodily movements while we're playing, figuring things out, analyzing things, evaluative feedback. Children at play are creating feedback for themselves and evaluating it. That's why we tell parents when you get in a car ride home, don't talk about the game because Johnny, Johnny has already given himself all the feedback he needs. Kids cognitively develop when they play to the point where they know what's right and wrong. They know where they've done well and they know where they need to improve. We don't need to really tell them all the time. Sometimes it helps to give them a little bit of assistance in solving the puzzle. But children who free play more often are what we call problem solvers. And we tell coaches all the time, if you really want great athletes, stop being the answer giver and start being the question asker. Be Socratic. Ask children why, what, how. Let them come up with the answers. The best thing we can do with a group of kids is a freeze moment where we say, freeze, take a picture. What's happening? Why? Could we do something differently? What would that look like? Let's do it. Because you've called out maybe one child, but everybody is assessing the situation from their perspective and evaluating it, and they're becoming these problem solvers. That's the cognitive development we see in children when they play. If you've ever, which we don't see that often anymore, if you've ever seen a group of kids just playing with no adults around, do you notice the cognitive development that's occurring? My favorite one is coaches always want to cut and move kids from one team to the other, creating super chickens, right? One team of all the kids who get all the resources and one team of all the kids who get none of the resources because they're the C team. And we wonder why this always works out that the A team's better than the C team. You put your best coach in all the resources here, <laughs> right? But you watch kids play, and like Drew said, they move themselves around. Oh, I'm outmatched in this group, so I'm going to go find a group where I'm a better matchup, where I can actually be in that zone of proximal development. Or, wow, we're killing this team. It's nine to nothing. Mikey, you go on our team. Uh, you three go on their team. We'll play 3v6 now. Kids do that. They solve the problem without us because the cognitive piece is there. And finally, the communication piece, and we talked about it. Kids at play learn to communicate with body language, with facial expressions, right? with different voice patterns and tones. My wife always tells the story of... Uh, <laughs> She used to babysit. <laughs> when I was in graduate school, we had to find ways to put me through school. So she babysat in the house. And she had this little girl who would always play act what was happening at home. And she would have these arguments, and then she'd have these fun moments. And, and she, my wife finally went to the, the mother and said, she's saying this stuff. And the mom says, it's actually happening. And she was working it out, and she was learning the communication patterns. Because this, this couple were very good at communicating with each other. So this little girl was mimicking it with her own voice to understand. When, there, when an argument would start to occur, one of the two in the couple, slow down. I understand you're upset, honey. Let's sit down and talk about this. This little girl would say things like, Jared, there's no popsicles in the popsicles. Anywhere. Who ate all the popsicles? I understand you. And she would talk like that. And my wife is like, she's like four years old, and she's figuring this out. She was understanding the communication patterns and how they affect people. 
When we take play away from kids and we make them sit in a seat and be quiet and stare at a chalkboard, they're not learning to communicate with these people around them. Or when we take play away and put a screen in front of them, like Drew said, then all of a sudden the communication patterns are nasty. But more importantly, communication has nothing to do with the words coming out of our mouths or the words being typed on the screen. It has to do with eye contact, right? It has to do with proximity. It has to do with tone and volume and pitch and all the other pieces of the puzzle. And the human brain houses in the insula right behind the prefrontal cortex is a little space where the self is housed. And we used to think our self was locked in a vault and that it couldn't be affected from the day we were born. We, we developed our self internally and the external world does not affect who we are. And we've discovered, no, nature and nurture, there are things in the environment that affect our self. One of them is, Every time you talk to somebody, if you look that person in the eyes, their self is listening to you and saying, do I want to believe this person? Do we find common ground? Is there a place where we can connect? That's why the rhetoric that we see, and he brought it up, so I'm just going to run with it, that we're seeing in the U.S. right now, this divide that we have is all electronic. It's not hardly any of it's personal. Because if I look you in the eyes and try to convince you of my idea, ourselves are connecting and communicating. But if I say it electronically or on TV, our selves aren't connecting, which is why we can say bad things to people or not believe other people or not find that common ground. But humans, by nature, we want to connect. It's how we survived when we were cave people. We huddled for warmth, we fought off the predators, and we hunted and gathered together. So the beauty of the brain in communication patterns is when children play, they get to look each other in the eyes, which means self is talking to self, which means brains are connecting and it creates that social connection that goes all the way back to that social piece. See the importance of play? Anybody deny the importance of play now? It goes way beyond, I mean, who starts thinking about brain science when they think about play? And yet, here we are. The final piece is creativity is the brain at play. There's an Albert Einstein quote, it's been attributed to him, but now they can't prove it, so I took it out, but it's intelligence Right, is, uh, I'm sorry, creativity is intelligence at play, right? Is what they claimed Albert Einstein said. So think about it. The last piece of the puzzle when kids play is creativity. Play for the body is play for the brain. As children free play and try new things and are creative, the brain is exploring and trying new things. The brain is building its own creativity. And creativity and innovation are what drives society. So our children need to play so that the brains have that creativity piece. All right, now I promised that I'd talk about parents just for a second. So for parents, what's the benefit of play? If you're talking to your parents or if you are parents, what's the benefit of free play or play for your children? Oops. Bonding. Right? Bonding. When was the last time? I'll say it. I don't know the last time I played with my kids. My wife said the other day, your back has kept you from being that dad. She goes, you were that dad. And now it's on my back, it's killing me. I'm sorry. So we have a rule in our house that you can't say can't. Can't means challenge accepted, no take backs. So my sons, I'm always telling them that, challenge accepted, no take, back, take backs. It's, it's advancing on its own. Challenge accepted, no take backs. My wife, a couple weeks ago, says, the boys want to learn to surf. We're in the car, front seat. She said, the boys want to learn to surf, so um, I'd love it if you take surf lessons with them. I said, oh, honey, I can't, my back. My youngest from the back seat, challenge accepted, no take backs, dad. And I realized, when was the last time I played with my son? Sometimes my son just wants to throw a ball. That's it. Why are you advancing? Sometimes my son just wants to throw a ball. That's it. He wants to bond with me. It has nothing to do with throwing the ball. He doesn't want to learn a new skill. He just wants me to play and bond. Second thing, stress management. Children who play, for parents that have children who are play and active in play, and the parents actually release them to play and not structure everything and guard everything, they learn to manage their own stresses. They also learn to recover from traumas faster, physical and mental. Children at play recover from traumas faster. Obesity, we talked about it. Not just obesity, but, but physical literacy in general. In, in the US, in Ohio, when I was in Ohio, we had a huge obesity epidemic. And they, we wanted to blame sports for it because kids weren't playing sports. But more importantly, it's not the obesity that was really the issue. It was these diseases that were cropping up based on lack of play, like diabetes. The kids needed movement because there were certain diseases that 
our movement patterns, our play, our active lifestyle, and then our eating and sleep habits based on that lifestyle helped us conquer. But with my kids, yeah, my kids are thin as rails. I'm not worried about my kid this way. What I'm worried about is my kid's femur not having that kind of bone density that we saw in those scans. And while video games may give him some of the pieces of the play puzzle, they're not giving him that piece. Academic readiness. We already talked about it. I don't need to go into it. If parents let their kids play for a little bit, they're more ready to study at night. It's why the structure for me growing up, for us growing up, was you went to school, you played sports, you did your homework. Well, my brain was ready after playing sports sometimes. <laughs> so we talked about it earlier. Why do kids play and why do kids quit? Fun. Main reason. The problem is, as adults, we define fun differently. So we think that if kids have fun, that they're not learning and they're not working. They're not being competitive. They're not giving their best. We think we're just going to sit in a circle and sing songs or run around holding hands going, la, 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 right? Utter chaos. Kids don't define it that way. Amanda Visick, a researcher in the US, V-I-S-E-K, decided to ask kids, what does fun mean to you? The children gave her 81 different ways to define fun. 81 different ways to define fun. In their winning was on the list, but it was 61st out of 81. So to us adults, winning means fun. To kids, eh, it's 61st. Fun to kids was a coach that learns, a coach that listens. I am battling these slides. Fun is a, kid, a coach that learns, a coach that listens, a coach that cares. Fun is being with their friends. Fun is being challenged. Fun is learning a new skill. Fun is having snacks. Fun is being with your friends. Fun is winning. It's all those pieces of the puzzle. So if we start to realize that children are defining fun 81 different ways and we structure our games and our sport around those 81 different ways, we as adults accomplish the things we want to accomplish. They work hard, they learn new skills, they take away all these valuable life characteristics. But to the kids, they're just having fun. And that's why I used to always tell my parents when we were playing a game with the kids and I'd structured movement patterns in there and some skill they were learning and all the social pieces of it and everything, and the kids didn't realize I was teaching them all this other stuff Okay, I turn to the parents and say, I'm cheating them. I'm fooling them. They think they're having fun, but they're learning all this other stuff in the process. So here's the reason why they quit. Not fun. Not fun. If, if it's not fun, why, why, why do it? And who's our biggest foe? When kids quit sport, where do they go? Anyone? Video games. Fortnite. How do we coach in a Fortnite generation? I mean, it's got us beat, hands down. The video game manufacturers listen to the children, for one thing. How do we know this? Who's ever seen the game Minecraft? Yeah. Who remembers playing pixelated games growing up and thinking, I can't wait until there are graphics that are actually legit here? And yet, my son, a couple years back, Dad, look at this cool game. This is the sweetest game. Look at these graphics. Son. A five-year-old made this game. It's blocky and pixelated. Isn't it awesome, Dad? That's because the video game manufacturers, the developers, realized that's what kids want, so they gave it to them. Fortnite evolves. Every couple of weeks, there's a new drop of a new concept in the game because they keep asking the kids what they want, and they keep giving the kids what they want. And so the kids stay in video games, and us coaches are like, you're going to play this way because that's how I play, and you're going to do what I say. Why are you leaving? And the kid's are like, I'm going to go play Fortnite because they do what I want to do. Right? So we're battling Fortnite. And here's the thing that video games do for kids that we haven't quite figured out in the sports realm. It's about them. All the video games are about the kids. We don't want blocky, pixelated characters. We don't care that. My son comes to me the other day and says, Dad, can I get five bucks? I said, for what? He says, I need to buy V-Bucks or whatever in Fortnite. I said, for what? And he says, so my character can do a new dance. I said, are you kidding me? You're going to spend money for a virtual character on a TV screen to dance. Son, give me five bucks, I'll dance for you. <laughs> and I don't dance, but for five bucks, I'll do it. It's about them. Everyone plays. Why would you go and play a sport when you know that only 30 kids are going to make it and they're going to cut the other 90? 
why not go and play a video game where 100 people at a time can hop in and the game is constantly reiterating. So no matter what, you can play. Whether it's two or 100, the game starts. And if you get knocked out, you just jump right into the next one. And yet, a few years back, USA Hockey started to figure out something was wrong, something was amiss in the puzzle. So they brought in Finland, who was one of the top hockey countries in the world, much smaller, right? sort of like Iceland and soccer. Why are you such a world power when you're so much smaller than us? And they took them to the East, and uh, the Finnish coaches were watching, were listening to this coach in the East who said, I just picked the top, whatever it was, 20 12-year-olds on the Eastern Seaboard to be on my team. These kids are fast-tracked to the Olympics, super chickens, right? We're going to give them all the resources they need so they can look at It's an interesting research. Uh, there's actually, Margaret Heffernan did a TED Talk on it, super chickens. Look it up. It's pretty interesting. Um, but these, these kids are going to be the top 20, right? So forget about all the other kids. And the Finnish coach goes, what about the weather 180? And the coach says, who cares? I picked the 20 best. He goes, no, but you left 180 kids on the table. He says, no, I picked the 20 best. And he says, at 12. But what about the other 180? You don't know who the best is until like 18 or 19. You cut the other 180. And it was like a light bulb moment. Bing. Oh, my goodness. But in sports, that's what we do. We cut them. We select them. We move them around. No. Video games, everybody plays. Doesn't matter how bad you are. I played with my sons one day. I was really bad. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. They're like, play again, Dad. Who cares? We don't care. They'll make fun of you. They'll roast you. But play again, Dad. It's safe to fail. It's safe to fail in video games. Because all you got to do is hit the reset button. Start over. Oops, I messed up. Bing. Oh, no big deal. They get to be with their friends. My son has friends back in Ohio that he left behind when we moved to San Diego two years ago. Guess what? He plays video games so you can talk to him. Hey, Dad, I got to get on the game because it's almost bedtime for Charlie back in Ohio. I just want to play for 30 minutes so I can see him and talk to him. Can't you pick up a phone, son? No. This mic and roasting him while we're playing video games, so much. Dude, what are you doing, dude? So much better. They get to level up. You see, my son doesn't need to win the video game every time. In fact, he doesn't. He actually puts on Instagram the times he wins, and they're very few and far between. And yet in youth sports, everything's measured on winning. If we're not winning, then we're out of the system. And yet in video games, they don't care about winning. They care about the process. Oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? It's exactly what we preach. Children should care about the process, mastery of skills, not the outcomes attached to them. And in video games, they do it. My son will lose the game. He'll, he'll die in Fortnite. I'm like, oh, no, man, that's, that's a bummer. He's like, no, no, Dad, don't worry. I got a new ax. I found the secret box and got a new axe. Don't worry, I'm leveling up, Dad. They level up, and then they start over. More ways to win because of it. They don't have to win the game to win. They find all kinds of different ways to win in video games. It's highly competitive. I've heard my son. He's far more competitive in Fortnite than he ever was in soccer. In soccer, they called him the escort because he'd run alongside other kids going, good job, you're so good, keep going. And the coach would go, no, take the ball. And after games, he'd go up to all his teammates and say, you did so well. Good job. You played. You worked so hard today. And the coaches would go, oh, he is your son. He is definitely your son. Right? But in Fortnite, oh, no. It is competitive. <laughs> it's their language. They say stuff I don't even understand what they're talking about. V-Bucks and all. And, and I'm like, what are you guys? It's their language. They've created a culture around play, around video games, a whole culture that is developing. Skateboarders are known for the skateboarding culture. Surfers that live in Southern California. You don't think we have a culture? Oh my goodness, man. The, the surfer ethos is strong. It's their language. It's silly. It's stupid. It's zany. Have you seen the dances? Who's seen the dances in Fortnite that they do? My, my son will be playing and, and, and he'll, he'll be like, Dad, look, this guy's not killing me. Look, he just gave me a shotgun and then he's dancing for me. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And finally, there are no adults. So what I want to ask you now is, how do we take what they're doing right in video games and help our coaches and our teachers and our parents incorporate it into their daily lives with their kids so that we can get them off the video games, or at least what we do with our son is a one-for-one -one exchange, and get them actually physically moving. So we talked about, do you understand how important play is now? No doubt about it, between the two talks, right? And we understand who our biggest competitor is and why they're crushing us. And yet, is there anything I threw up on this list, these, these last two pages, that we can't do in sports? 
I mean, can't we speak their language in sports? We may have to teach a skill slightly differently to younger kids than we would older kids because we have to speak their language. Can't we be zany and silly in sports? My wife used to call me the big bunny because when I got with five-year-olds, I was bounced. Actually, when I got with 18-year-olds, it didn't matter the age. I bounced off the wall, silly and zany. I didn't care how stupid I looked. It was about them learning. And I learned it from my coach who was that way. He'd use these voices and then I'd copy the voices. And let me tell you, this voice, the 18-year-olds love just as much as the five-year-olds. <laughs> So can't we use that in sports? So let's look at three ways that we can help others start to, in ourselves, put play back in sports. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Pass the controller, to put it in video game terms. Give the kids the controller. Right? Come on, son. You got to step it up. <laughs> I love that because it's Canadian. It's, I always tell the US people, I'm like, go look up Hockey Canada PSAs. They're like six or seven of them. They're fabulous. One of the guys getting a speeding ticket and the kid's in the back seat going, there's an idiot. He's blind. You're going to take that call? <laughs> Another one, the girl, the grocery cart gets bumped by somebody else in the produce aisle. And she goes, mom, you going to let her hit you and hit her like that? Take her down. Guy's putt and his son's on the other side of the green going, come on, concentrate, focus. Oh, you missed the putt. This is such a waste. <laughs> and yet, that's what we do. But I like this one because this is why kids play hide and seek. Because there are no adults around. And what happens when an adult shows up? We're sticking them down manholes, right? <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? They'll never find you there, son. <laughs> right? So we've got to give them the play. We have got to stop taking over their play. Joe Eisenman, who's a famous um, physical literacy movement, he's actually strength and conditioning, all those pieces of the puzzle in the US, worked with USA Football for years, once posted on Twitter a couple of years back a series of pictures. He was at a group of USA youth football games, and little brothers had showed up, and they were playing. And I remember doing this. I had an older brother. This is how I lived, man. I got stuck going to his games. I never saw a single inning pitched or, or ball kicked. I was over with my buddies playing games. We just made them up. Like, what do you got? Uh, I got a kickball and a bat and one base. All right, well, OK, we're going to hit the kickball with the bat. OK, and then you got to, and Mike, you're running with the base, and we got to find you and dive on the base to be safe. Oh, works for me. Right, you just made it up. So these kids are playing. And the first picture shows them playing. He says, this is awesome. Little brothers at free play. The next picture, you see the kids, and there's this older guy walking up. And he says, uh-oh, here comes dad. The next picture is the kids standing in line. And I, I swear, one of them's like this. And dad is lecturing. And he's like, the adults have taken over. What was just fun free play for these kids suddenly became adult structured. It's OK to pass the remote every once in a while and say, kids, go play. Let them figure it out. They're building the social and the communicative and the cognitive and all the other pieces of the puzzle we talked about when we let them free play a little bit. That's really hard for coaches, but we tell coaches. One of the easiest ways to do it is when you show up at training sessions and your kids are already playing, stop, freeze, bring it in. All right, you get in the line, you get in the line. No, let them play for a little bit. Is the game they're playing, can you turn it into the lesson you'd come in mind? Like if your theme was spreading out and creating more space on the field or whatever, and the kids are playing a game, can you incorporate that into the game and let them keep playing and then slowly incorporate that in or freeze them and ask them questions so they suddenly realize that they're doing what you wanted anyway, and then just build on that? Let them play. Let them discover. Best thing you can do at the end of practice is, all right, we're going to finish with a game. Do you want to play this game or this game? Hey, I don't have to let them completely choose, but limited choices at least helps me narrow it down, right? You want to play A or B? Now they have a little bit of power. For us, for our parents, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. For every 30 minutes you play in the video games, we're going to go out and play for 30 minutes. Your call, whatever game you want. Press play.
The wrong way to go. Oh, well, doesn't really matter, does it? When he got to his home, they changed his name to Rocky, then changed it to Ori. So he's probably a bit confused. <laughs> Some people think he should have stayed as Rocky as his dad should have, but Ori is totally crazy. As you can see, he's having a ball. Loves life and exercise. Well done, the Blue Cross. <laughs> Persevere. First catch your dog. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm out. <laughs> that was the moment. That was the moment. So I always put that up there when I talk to coaches because how many coaches have shown up with a perfect training plan, right? Or how many parents have shown up at the park with a perfect day of play? We've got frisbees, we've got this, we've got, you know, we're going to play this and we're going to do that and everything like that. And it all just the kids just say no. And they have their own game plan. That dog fell once, fell once, and his brain said, forget this stuff. I'm just having fun now. It's all over. And so what we need to understand is it's okay every once in a while just to press play, just to let them play. And and we're going to have chaos sometimes in our training sessions. But like I learned as a kindergarten teacher, when I let them play, it ignited the brain. It empowered them. And they were more engaged in the classroom. I had to sometimes reel it back in. But in the long run, they learned what they were expected. They hit the standards. But more importantly, every once in a while, I get messages from those parents or those kids because we created memories. And yes, the dog completely failed the obstacle course. But isn't that a great memory? How many soccer practices, how many hockey practices, how many lacrosse practices have we had where chaos took over and we just let go and let the kids sort of have that moment of fun and joy? Not often. But how many memories link back to those moments of fun and joy? I don't know of any adult today, raise your hand to prove me wrong, who sits and goes, gosh, I remember that time I stood in line for 25 minutes before I got the dribble when I was nine years old. Or I remember that time that coach yelled at us and lectured us for 35 minutes, but I got to shoot on goal once. You don't remember those things because play creates the memories. Press mute. Keep watching her. <laughs> Here we go. Weaving in and out. on the phone now if you couldn't tell. So we show that video a lot because the mom didn't do anything wrong. There was nothing malicious, nothing nasty. She wasn't calling out, but it was just constant, right? And so the human brain really can't multitask. It has to put priority. It's like a computer has to put priority to certain processes. So we have coaches yelling, and we have parents yelling, and we have referees saying things, and teammates yelling, and the brain's already telling us stuff because it's got a voice. As a kid, we wonder why our kids freeze. Why'd you just freeze up out there? I don't know, because 900 people were telling me what to do, right? And some of it positive, some of it negative, but my brain went, eh, right? The brain, when it has too much stimuli, actually slows down. There's a really cool test out there called the Stroop test for the Stroop effect, S-T-R-O-O-P. Use it with your parents. Use it with your coaches. Show them because what it shows is that when you have multiple stimuli in an environment, the brain will slow down to try to process, and then it gives priority to one over the other. It prioritizes. So when we multitask, it's kind of a myth. How many of you have ever been on the phone and written an email at the same time? Did something that was said in the phone call end up in the email or vice versa? That's because the brain is like, all right, somebody's talking on the phone. All processes over here. Process, process. Oh, wait, wait. Fingers are moving. Processes over here. Process, process. Wait, wait. No. 
It doesn't actually multitask, it just sends more resources to one or the other. So the best thing we can do for our children is just press mute once in a while. When they're playing, especially if it's structured, they don't feel like it's ever going to be free play if we're constantly joysticking them. But if we shut up, excuse the expression, if we shut up and let them play every once in a while, even the structured components of play suddenly feel like free play because their own voice is the one doing the direction, not ours. And the final piece of the puzzle, and I may try to turn this down because I don't think there's, it's a skateboarder. So I don't, I, I checked it and didn't quite catch any, but I, I may turn it down because I don't know because he's a skateboarder and may have language. So, but I want you to watch this because this final one is press reset. This is so vital for our children. They live in a world where they can't make mistakes. They do nothing because it's easier to do nothing than to fail. And that's because every mistake they make, they're pulled off the field and put on the bench. You get in there, he's not doing his job. Or they get in the car and every mistake they've made is pointed out. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. So kids need to, to learn to make mistakes. Oh yeah, let them press reset, not us, but them. If he'll move for me, is he gonna move? There we go. One. I cut this down, it was five minutes long. Five minutes long. And I, like I said, it's got him talking over his voice in the background and a couple of those landings. I'm pretty sure he, sure he went, ah! But just in case it wasn't, ah, we'll, um, yeah. See, that one right there, I'm not sure if he said something. But in the voice over what he's saying is I kept trying again and again and again and again. I went out every day and I tried again and again and again. I tried 2,000 times, 2,000 times over the course of 30 days to get this trick, the laser flip kick. Notice the frustration. It's okay for kids to feel frustrated. We want to wrap our arms around them and love on them when they're frustrated. No, it's okay. He made himself sick, right? And then, he, and then he's like this, like, it's okay, I'm going to keep going. Why do I show that? Because he fell at least 2,000 times before he got the trick right. And each time he fell, there was frustration, there was anger, there was self-doubt, but he popped right back up and he did it again. We have to let our children learn to hit the reset button every once in a while, just like they do in video games. When my son loses in Fortnite, he jumps right back into another game. When it doesn't go the way he wanted to, he presses the mental and physical reset button and starts again. In sports, though, they are punished the moment they make a mistake. In life, lately, we punish our kids for making bad choices or not having the outcomes we wanted, instead of using those choices and those outcomes to learn. And if you really want to help them, those 2,000 times, I'll bet he would have loved just once somebody to say, hey, what do you think happened? What could you do differently? What would that look like if you did it that way? I believe in you. Do it again. Sometimes that's all it takes for our kids. Let them press the reset button, ask them a few questions, and then let them try it again. So those are the ways that we can help our children. Those are the ways that we can help our children. Use play. You understand the massive importance of it? It's on us. It's on us to teach the others. So as Drew said, and now follow up with us, he talked about learning to talk here about stuff and then taking it and applying it. One of my favorite authors, Scott Birkin, um, once said that the, all progress hinges on the gap between those who will talk in private and those who will act in public. So our goal going away from this weekend is to take everything that we talk about in groups and in the breakouts, if you're in mine, it's all you doing the work because you're the experts. Take what we learn from each other and go do something, even if it's just one thing. Even if it's just press and mute, let them press reset, press and play, pass in the controller, one of those things. Or if it's one of the five questions that Drew asked, do it. Just go and do it because that's where progress is, is in that gap between us talking about it and doing it. Thank you.
Um, I came up with uh, tool cards with Jane Nelson, who's one of the leading experts in positive discipline. She's been doing it, well, she is positive discipline. She's been doing it for about 40 years, primarily with teachers and parents. And for years, she'd want to do it with coaches. So I got lucky about two years ago, she and I started talking about it. And this year, we finally did it. We built tool cards for coaches. And a lot of coaches say, how do I manage these challenges? How do I manage these issues and everything? These tool cards, we're hoping, are sort of the, the, the help that these coaches need. If you go to pdatplay.com, it's not working right now. I couldn't get it to work this morning, but I'll get it up for you. But hang on to that address. You can get on the early list. We did them first for soccer shots. You can see them down in the corner. Cartoon on one side, instructions on the back. And, uh, but we're going to do them for the general public. These are a great resource for your parents and coaches. How do I deal with kids who are runners? How do I deal with kids who have behavior issues? How do I deal with kids, with, with kids who, who don't talk? How do I, because if they see a challenge as coaches, they quit. We quit. Or we, we put that kid in a box and we shove them aside. Instead of that challenge is an opportunity for that child to grow, here's a tool to help. So I just thought I'd, I'd plug that because it's a fantastic opportunity for, for coaches.